tonight on NJTV News, turning up the heat on a proposed deep water port that would pump liquefied natural gas from boats in the harbor to New York. The company says it's needed, but is it safe? Planned Parenthood provides health care to millions because it also provides abortions. It's been on the defense in Congress and on the campaign trail, but now has a powerful defender. And the dune dance, what nature takes, we replace, then nature takes it again. After last week's storm, people are asking at what point does beach replenishment become an exercise in futility? Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by Barnabas Health. Life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello and thanks for joining us at Deepwater Port, where liquefied natural gas would be pumped from ship to shore. The company proposing it calls it a boon. Environmental groups call it a threat. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. A company called Liberty Natural Gas wants to build a liquefied natural gas port in the Atlantic. Tankers loaded with compressed natural gas would hook into a new pipeline that would carry the gas to an existing line that feeds Long Island, New York. The location is 28 miles off of Long Branch, 18 miles off Long Island. The company calls it Port Ambrose. New Jersey environmentalists and two shore Republican legislators gathered today to oppose it. And so we're here today to announce again our reaffirming our opposition to Port Ambrose and the lack of need for such a ridiculous facility in the middle of our ocean. The opponents say the gas is not needed, that two similar ports in Massachusetts are idle because there's no longer any demand for foreign natural gas and that putting it out there is dangerous. It's an overcrowded shipping zone. Why in the world, when you have some of the busiest ports in the world, would you put a target like that right in the middle of them? The company has been trying to build for eight years. An earlier attempt was vetoed in 2011 by Governor Christie. Clean Ocean Action has a video of him saying he'll never support it. As long as I'm governor, we will oppose any application for any type of LNG project. <laughs> Senator Jennifer Beck is sponsoring a resolution to stop the project. No will be no today, 10 years from today, 20 years from today. Nice. They need to go home. You know, we need an LNG port off our coast like we need another superstorm. And if we have one out there, when there is another storm, it's a bomb waiting to go off. Absolutely not. That is all hyped by uh, Clean Ocean Action. Jim Donofrio, who heads the Recreational Fishermen's Alliance, supports the project. We don't see this as a threat. Um, we see it as something positive. He says natural gas doesn't spill like oil and that the fishing industry depends on cheap fossil fuels. A lot of the people that are going to these protest meetings are very disingenuous because they still drive their cars and they still heat their houses with, uh, with natural gas and other oil products. So uh, until they can ride their bicycles and find another way to heat their house, they have no credibility with me. The company told NJTV News... We are confident that when the facts about the minimal impacts and many benefits that Port Ambrose would bring to the region become known, the public will support the project. To hear these people tell it, an LNG port off the coast of New Jersey poses serious risks and isn't needed. They're relying on Governor Christie to do what he did four years ago when the project was proposed off Asbury Park and veto it. In Seabright, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Rutgers football has lawyered up. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop is Scataway, where Rutgers Senior Vice President for External Affairs has confirmed an outside law firm that only handles potential NCAA rules violations is conducting a top-to-bottom review of the football program. This after the head coach was suspended for violating academic policy. Some players were arrested for armed robbery. One, who allegedly failed multiple drug tests while on the team, 
and star wide receiver Leonti Carew was charged with assault. That charge is expected to be dropped. Lawyers also want to know whether sexual favors were provided prospective student athletes. The firm will release its report to Rutgers and the NCAA, which could apply penalties. Next to Newark, where Devils legendary goaltender Martin Brodeur will see his number 30 jersey flying high above the ice at the Rock, only the fourth number to be retired in Devils history. On February 9th, just before the Edmonton Oilers game, Brodeur will be celebrated for his extraordinary 20 seasons in the NHL, winner of three Stanley Cups and four Vesna trophies as the league's top goaltender. All but three of his record 691 wins and all but one of his record 125 shutouts came with the Devils. Brodeur's best memory? The fans. He says he saw kids in diapers grow to shake his hand as 20-year-olds. He called that pretty cool. Finally, Highlands and a pretty cold reception for a monument to the survivors of Superstorm Sandy. Engineers say it is a marvel of design and physics. The 173-ton canopy perched atop four concrete pillars has three cone-shaped rounded openings that allow those inside to gaze up at the sky while simultaneously getting shelter from the sun. But it's raised the hackles of some locals who call the donated architectural wonder the bunker on the beach and Shorehenge, and right next to the new community center, too. Oh, well, it was free. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, October 6th. Something up in your town? Tip us off. Planned Parenthood provides health services to more than 2.5 million Americans each year, but this year it's under siege. On the campaign trail and in Congress, 151 Republicans voted to shut the government down if it wasn't defunded. As Brenda Flanagan reports, Democratic Representative Frank, Fal Frank Pallone came out swinging in its defense. It is actually, actually shocking um, that we as a House of Representatives have gotten to this point. Congressman Frank Pallone stood with Planned Parenthood supporters in Perth Amboy and explained the House GOP now wants to establish a new select subcommittee for the sole purpose of investigating the embattled health care provider. Obviously the goal of the Republicans in the House is to completely shut down Planned Parenthood. The bruising partisan politics around Planned Parenthood only gained intensity after gotcha videos shot by pro-life advocates focused on the group's practice of providing fetal tissue from abortions for medical research. Planned Parenthood insists it doesn't profit, but its staff in heavily edited segments can appear glaringly insensitive at best when discussing compensation. The tapes ignited a Republican firestorm of condemnation, including presidential primary candidates candidate Carly Fiorina's now infamous mischaracterization of one clip. Watch a fully formed fetus on the table, its heart beating, its legs kicking, while someone says we have to keep it alive to harvest its brain. The most recent Republican push to strip Planned Parenthood of federal funding failed. For its part, the organization didn't retrench or reorganize, and critics charge its finances remain frustratingly opaque. Instead, Planned Parenthood circled the wagons, and its president vigorously defended the group in congressional hearings last week. The outrageous accusations leveled against Planned Parenthood based on heavily doctored videos are offensive and categorically untrue. I realize, though, that the facts have never gotten in the way of these campaigns to block women from health care they need and deserve. In New Jersey, Planned Parenthood serves more than 100,000 residents a year at 26 health centers around the state, nine in medically underserved areas. They do pap smears, test for HIV, and offer affordable birth control options. I contacted Planned Parenthood for um, basically to seek birth control and to seek different methods of birth control to basically learn more about how to protect myself. Where would you go if there wasn't a Planned Parenthood? 
I honestly don't know. I would have to look into that. It's just my place, my go-to place. I've always come here for their services. Planned Parenthood wants to refocus attention away from abortion. Like one student here said, if you get proper health care and birth control, it makes having to confront a traumatic abortion far less likely. In Perth Amboy, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. The Justice Department is about to grant early release to some 6,000 inmates from federal prisons serving harsh long-term sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. Since the U.S. Sentencing Commission cut the potential punishment for future drug offenders and then made that change retroactive, nearly half of the nation's 100,000 federal drug offenders could go free. Federal prosecutors have been instructed not to charge low-level, nonviolent, non-gang-related drug offenders with crimes carrying severe mandatory sentences. And senators, including Cory Booker, have introduced a criminal justice reform bill. Both the conservative Koch brothers and the American Civil Liberties Union are backing. Michael Hill reports. Since the 1980s and the crack cocaine era, the federal prison population has exploded by 800%. Part of the blame, laws mandating judges give nonviolent drug offenders minimum sentences that some say are too long and don't fit the crime. We are notable amongst humanity for being the most incarcerating nation on earth. It's a distinction no one should be proud of. Senator Cory Booker is among those critics and part of a group of senators who span the political spectrum and sponsor the Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act. And so this is a system that could make us safer, elevate human potential, save taxpayer money, and better reflect our values. The bill would give judges more discretion by allowing nonviolent drug sentences below the mandatory minimum, reducing sentences of low-risk offenders in rehab programs, eliminating mandatory life for three-time nonviolent offenders, limiting solitary confinement for juveniles in federal custody, and creating more reentry programs. When I first came home, it was a struggle. Tafawa Belagoon struggled to explain where he had learned kitchen skills as he applied for jobs after 30 years in prison for murder. Because things were so difficult, I had resorted back to crime. Robbery, six months in the Hudson County Jail, and an introduction to Martin's Place, the Jersey City Employment and Training Program focusing on prisoner reentry. JSEPT, as it's called, helped Tafawa with housing and a job at a bakery where he's been promoted. And from that point, I've been you know, doing tremendously good. It's at long last, it's needed. Former Governor Jim McGreevy welcomes Congress taking action. He's JSEP's executive director. He says New Jersey is among a handful of states reforming criminal justice. But you see like wide swaths of America that are in love with incarceration. And what we don't understand is that incarceration has a cost. It's $45,000 a year to lock somebody up for a single year. That's an, a very expensive proposition. Seton Hall University law professor John Kip Cornwell says congressional action offers a teaching moment about over-incarceration. The federal offenders represent only 200,000 of the 1.5 million people behind bars, right? So it's not going to have a profound across the board effect, but I think it's an important first step which serves as a bit of a model for the states. Hopefully states will take a look at what the federal government government's doing and they'll choose to do something similar and that will have a true long-lasting and important effect. The Sentencing Reform and Corrections Act has a long way to go before becoming law, but the consensus is saving taxpayers money and reforming the criminal justice system are long overdue. In Jersey City, Michael Hill, NJTV News.
Newark Mayor Raz Baraka is looking to the past for a new approach to persistent unemployment, violence, and poverty. Just as the United States' $13 billion Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe after World War II, Baraka is calling for an urban Marshall Plan, asking for federal money for a public works project to update Newark's 19th century infrastructure, regenerate manufacturing, and provide job training. Meantime, as Aaron Delmore reports, the Newark Workforce Investment Board is opening workshops on web development for Newarkers chasing the dream. I used to do it just by hand, and it happened the computer revolution. Juan Guerra is a graphic designer. He's been out of work for two years. He's hoping to earn a spot in one of Newark's job training programs to become a web developer. It looks like my skills are obsolete, so I try to upgrade myself. Representatives from Newark City Hall introduced the program to unemployed residents. 144 hours of instruction over 12 weeks and a laptop, all free. All right, if you're interested and you're committed, this will work for you. It's the latest effort to stem the unemployment crisis in New Jersey's biggest city. Mayor Roz Baraka said Newark needs to create 6,000 jobs just to bring its unemployment rate in line with the rest of the state. First, I should apologize because it's September, a full year into the mayor's term. I can tell you a plan we wrote up where we would have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in a pipeline, wherever they are, to meet them where they are and get this going. The apology is, you know, we're kind of late getting started. Right. The state unemployment rate has been consistently trickling down month to month, hitting its best number in seven years at 5.5 percent. But unemployment in Newark towered at 8.7 percent. Isaiah Little from the Office of Information Technology isn't surprised by the turnout here or at the mayor's recent tech town hall. He says an investment in tech will pay dividends, whether residents join the ranks at Audible, headquartered nearby, or start their own companies. And with junior web developers earning between thirty and $50,000 a year, it's an enticing prospect. What are these potential career paths? Essentially, by the end of this, you'll be a junior level front-end web designer. But the competition is tough. The class is only open to unemployed residents of Newark. To get in, you have to demonstrate an ability to read and to do math at the eighth grade level, complete around 17 hours worth of web-based exercises to show computer literacy, and submit a 250-word essay on why you want to be in the class. About 100 people have turned in pieces of the required work, and 10 have been accepted into the program. There are 10 more spots left in the class, and program administrators say you can try for one at theartofcode.org. They hope to start this first class during the week of October 19th. For NJTV News, I'm Erin Delmore. New Jersey is one of the wealthiest states in the nation, with the second highest median household income, according to the U.S. Census. Yet close to a million people here live in poverty. The federal poverty rate for a family of four is $24,250. Given the high cost of living here, a family needs twice that to stay above water, and one in four families isn't making it. That's according to the Added Poverty Network of New Jersey. Its executive director is Serena Rice. Thank you for being here, Serena. What are your biggest challenges in helping to alleviate poverty in New Jersey? Well, poverty, I think, in, in, in New Jersey is something that is often hidden. Uh, we don't think of people being in poverty in New Jersey because, as you said, it is such a, a wealthy state on average. Um, and so the first thing we have to do in order to be able to address the realities of one in four people in the state really struggling economically is first to raise awareness about that reality and and to make sure that we understand that poverty isn't just the stereotypes of perhaps someone sleeping on a park bench there's those folks in New Jersey we need to care for them but we also need to care for the single mom who is working two jobs in order to meet her children's needs the couple that are working minimum wage and therefore not even able to meet their needs much less think about starting a family. Um, the, the teachers, the, the preschool workers, the home health aides, mm -hmm. all these folks who are a vital part of our economy but are really struggling economically. And we need to recognize that their struggle is a result of our economic system and the fact that our cost of living is so far beyond what people are able to make. How does living in poverty in the inner city differ from living in poverty in suburbia? 
Well, there's different kinds of challenges. When you talk about inner city poverty, you're dealing with a reality of concentrated poverty. And so people um, don't have access to the same kinds of job opportunities in, in the inner city as exist in the suburbs. Um, but they do have a social service safety net that is designed to respond to the needs of folks in the inner cities, at least on, on a subsistence level. Um, and so there's, there's the challenges of lack of opportunity, of concentrated poverty, of failing schools in the inner cities. Whereas in the suburbs, where we are seeing a growing amount of poverty, the challenge is that folks are, are trying to survive on inadequate incomes in a system that's really designed for the middle class. And so they're relying on public transportation, perhaps, where mm -hmm. there really isn't a good system. Um, they, they don't have access to the same kinds of assistance programs like food pantries or right. social well, services. How does the APN work to address all this multitude of problems? Well, the thing that we have to start with is building a network, right? We're the anti-poverty network because poverty is not a problem that can be solved with just one solution. We need all of the different um, stakeholders joining together and working together on more comprehensive solutions. It's and interesting to me that one of the stakeholders, among the stakeholders, are people who actually live in poverty. Why is it important to hear their voices? Well, they're the ones who actually know how it's working in their lives, right? When, when we put forward a program, we think it's a wonderful program, but until we talk to the people who are actually receiving the services, we don't know how it's actually received in terms of responding to the needs. And we also don't always get the same kinds of ideas for innovative solutions out of policy thinkers. Speaking of innovative, you are encouraging state legislators to sign a pledge, is that right? That's right. And this goes back to the reality that we need comprehensive responses to poverty. So we have put forward a poverty solutions pledge for all of the candidates for assembly this year. Um, we're asking everyone to sign on to recognize that poverty is a problem that affects one in four New Jerseyans and to say that they will work with us and our partners to advance solutions. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Here's today's NJTV News question. What's your definition of the American dream? Share your thoughts with us on our Facebook page or tweet us. The American dream should be that you don't get persecuted for being of, of a different country. Going from not necessarily nothing, but from less to more. You're free to do the things you want to do. It's an opportunity for everyone. It's probably a fantasy. Everybody can't get in the door. The door only opens so wide. We must have visions, not dreams. America is a beautiful place, the land of milk and honey. That's the dream, dreaming on that milk and honey. Many millions of dollars have been spent since Sandy washed the sand away, rebuilding beaches as a bulwark against the next storm. It took Joaquin only a drive-by to wash away those rebuilt beaches, and in Ortley Beach, they're starting over, but at what cost? Brianna Venosi reports. Steep cliffs of sand line the Jersey coast, ranging anywhere from a four to 14 foot drop. Crews in Ortley Beach Toms River have been working since before this weekend storm, bringing in sand to shore up the dunes. 50 plus year residents don't see replenishment, just money being thrown out to sea. The waves just ate it up in one day. So what they're doing now is only temporary until another storm comes along and we'll be back where we started again. The pounding waves and gusting winds caused severe beach erosion, especially along a stretch of northern Ocean County. As of yesterday, 400 of these big dump trucks of uh, sand out. Uh, how many they've done today? But as you can see, there's a steady convoy of them coming. No flooding or damage to homes here, but Tom's River Mayor Tom Keller says the beaches have never been fully restored since Superstorm Sandy. We're still waiting for the Army Corps of Engineers to come through with their beach replenishment problem and we still have a lot of people holding out signing easements and if this storm and the condition of this beach isn't an incentive for people to sign those easements I don't know what what else is. The Army Corps project will enlarge the beach by about the length of a football field by dredging offshore then enlarge the dunes. DEP is fighting about 250 homeowners along the barrier island in Ocean County who refuse to sign easements. Since that storm I've spent more time trying to get these dunes uh, constructed than I have on everything else put together.
Toms River got a $1 million grant through the department for the sand, but that doesn't pay for the crews hauling it in or spreading it around. Crews are only able to work during low tide because as you can see, these beaches have gotten very narrow. Depending upon where you walk along the beach, some of these cliffs are up to 12 feet high and neighbors say during the height of the storm, the waves reached up to 14 feet high. This is going to be a lifetime thing. You got a certain, the government got to come in here and I don't think they're going to do it, but buy these houses out or make a certain zone where it's safe. And that's what's happening. You don't, they're never going to stop. This is Mother Nature. You're never going to stop it. It's only the beginning of October. That's what we're very concerned about. It's only the beginning of October. The hurricane season runs through November, and the northeast storms are sometimes a lot worse after the first of the year. So we are extremely vulnerable. Crews will continue to work through the week until either the sand runs out or the money. In Ortley Beach, I'm Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. Tomorrow on NJTV News, we're expecting a major development in the control of urban schools. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. And the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Camden students face a lot of challenges, but they meet them with determination and drive. Teachers like Ms. Harris make me feel like I'm part of a team, not just on a basketball court, but in a classroom. Chanel is not just a star athlete, she is a star student. I'm headed to Clemson University where I can combine my love of sports and learning and maybe even win a championship. I wouldn't bet against her or any of my students reaching for their dreams.